Welcome to another episode of Rithu the Explorer Travel Vlog. In this episode, let's climb those ancient stone steps and explore not just the physical height of the Tower of London, but also the lofty heights of its rich and sometimes turbulent past. Join us as we delve into stories of royal intrigue, uncovering tales that have been etched into the very walls of this historic fortress. We bought the tickets for Tower of London at a cost of £33.60, roughly equivalent to 3,561 Indian rupees per person. The Tower of London stands as an iconic symbol of British history, looming majestically on the banks of the River Thames in the heart of London. With its origins dating back nearly a millennium, this historic fortress has served variously as a royal palace, a prison, an armory, a treasury, a menagerie, and even as the home of the crown jewels of England. Its rich and often tumultuous history makes it one of the most visited and revered landmarks in the United Kingdom. Now, assume a reasonable value for this. The Tower of London isn't just one tower, it's actually a complex of several. When you think of the tower, you might picture dark dungeons, grim beheadings, or maybe you envision the glittering crown jewels. There's so much more though, this place has been a royal palace, a fortress, even a zoo. That's right, kings and queens of the past actually kept exotic animals gifted to them right there. Wild, isn't it? Imagine that way back in the 11th century. It's a classic example of Norman military architecture and has stood the test of time, surviving fires, wars, and the ever-changing skyline of London. But let's get to the heart of it. The White Tower, that's the central one, was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. Speaking of time, did you know that the tower has been home to the Royal Mint up until the 19th century? Edward I, 1272 to 1307, installed the mint within the safety of the tower's walls in 1279, and until 1810, most of the coins of the realm were made there in a dedicated area that became known as Mint Street. Making coins was hot, noisy, and dangerous. Tampering with coins was treason, and the threat of horrific punishment deterred most, if not all, thieves and forgers. The Tower's Mint is a permanent exhibition at the Tower of London features rare and unique objects from the Royal Mint Museum's collection. Discover the history of the Mint when it was at the Tower of London from 1279 to 1812 through this exhibition.
Throughout its history, the tower has played a central role in the power struggles, political intrigue, and dramatic events that shaped England. It was here that numerous prominent figures met their fates, either through execution, imprisonment, or political machinations. Perhaps the most famous prisoner held within its walls was Anne Boleyn, the second wife of King Henry VIII, who was executed on charges of treason and adultery in 1536. Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII welcomed their daughter Elizabeth, who later became Queen Elizabeth I, overseeing the prosperous Elizabethan era. Despite her remarkable reign, Henry's desire for a son, Anne's inability to provide one, and his pursuit of another wife contributed to Anne's tragic downfall. Anne's story continues to captivate historians and enthusiasts alike, emblematic of the complex and tumultuous nature and scan of Tudor politics and royal relationships. Anne Boleyn's life was indeed enveloped in a court scandal that reverberated throughout Tudor England. Sir Walter Raleigh, an English statesman, soldier, writer, and explorer of the Elizabethan era, is remembered for introducing the potato and tobacco to Europe. Sir Walter Raleigh's quest for El Dorado, the legendary city of gold, took him on expeditions to the Americas. Despite his ambitious pursuits, Raleigh's endeavors ended in disappointment, as the fabled treasure remained elusive. Nonetheless, his adventures fueled European fascination with gold and the pursuit of riches in the New World. Despite his notable contributions, his reckless nature led to imprisonment in the Tower of London three times. James VI and first succeeded to the English throne on the death of his cousin, Elizabeth I. Following a reduced sentence in 1603, Raleigh spent 13 years confined, where he enjoyed relative comfort and continued his scholarly pursuits, including writing his renowned work, The History of the World. However, his release was short-lived as he faced treason charges and was executed in 1618. The Tower's association with imprisonment and torture has left an indelible mark on its legacy. Tales of its dark dungeons, the infamous Traitor's Gate through which prisoners were brought in by boat, and the eerie White Tower with its chilling history as a prison and execution site have captivated imaginations for centuries. The Tower of London has also gained a reputation for mystery and intrigue, enveloping countless stories of ghostly apparitions, inexplicable events, and unresolved mysteries. Another mystery happened was, The Princes in the Tower is a haunting historical mystery that has fascinated generations. The two young princes at the center of this enigma were Edward V of England and his younger brother Richard, Duke of York, the sons of King Edward IV and his queen, Elizabeth Woodville. Their disappearance and presumed murder occurred during the turbulent period known as the Wars of the Roses in 1483. The mystery surrounding the fate of the princes in the tower has fueled countless theories and debates over the centuries. Some believe they were murdered on the orders of Richard III or his supporters, while others suggest they may have been killed by rival factions seeking to undermine Richard's rule. Another theory proposes that they may have been smuggled out of the tower and survived under assumed identities. In 1674, during renovations to the Tower of London, the skeletons of two young boys were discovered buried under a staircase. Many speculated that these were the remains of the princes in the tower, although conclusive evidence has never been found to confirm their identities or cause of death. The destiny of the princes and the tumultuous circumstances of their era take center stage in William Shakespeare's historical drama, Richard III. The fate of the princes in the tower remains one of history's most enduring mysteries, shrouded in intrigue and speculation. Despite the passage of time, their story continues to capture the imagination of historians, scholars, and enthusiasts alike serving as a poignant reminder of the dark and often brutal realities of medieval politics and power struggles. As speculation intensified, the tower underwent a name change, transitioning from the Garden Tower to the infamous Bloody Tower. Despite its grim past, the Tower of London has also served as a royal residence and a symbol of royal power and authority. Today, St. Thomas's Tower, the Wakefield Tower, and the Lanthorn Tower within the Tower of London are collectively referred to as the Medieval Palace.
Kings and queens resided within its walls, and it was here that they hosted lavish banquets, held court, and displayed their wealth and majesty. St. John's Chapel, nestled within the historic walls of the Tower of London, stands as a testament to the enduring spiritual significance of this iconic fortress. Built in the early 11th century during the reign of William the Conqueror, St. John's Chapel is one of the oldest surviving Norman churches in England and serves as a rare example of medieval ecclesiastical architecture within a military stronghold. The Line of Kings is a historic exhibition housed within the Tower of London, offering visitors a captivating journey through centuries of royal history. Located within the iconic White Tower, the Line of Kings has been showcasing the armor and weaponry of England's monarchs since the 17th century, making it one of the oldest exhibitions of its kind in the world. The centerpiece of the exhibition is the spectacular display of life-sized wooden figures adorned in full armor representing various kings from different periods of English history. These figures are accompanied by an impressive array of weapons, including swords, shields, and suits of armor, providing a vivid glimpse into the martial prowess and regal splendor of England's monarchs. Originally conceived as a means of bolstering royal prestige and asserting the divine right of kings, the line of kings has evolved over the centuries, reflecting changing attitudes towards monarchy and national identity. In addition to its historical significance, the exhibition also serves as a testament to the craftsmanship and artistry of armorers and metalworkers throughout the ages. Visitors to the line of kings can immerse themselves in the rich tapestry of English history, from the medieval warriors and knights in shining armor to the Tudor monarchs and their dazzling courtly attire. The exhibition offers a unique opportunity to explore the lives and legacies of England's kings, and from the legendary Henry VIII and the gilded armors of Charles I and James II, as one of the Tower of London's most popular attractions, the line of kings continues to captivate visitors with its blend of history, art, and pageantry. The royal armories have always featured extraordinary curiosities, discover the armors of the giant, the dwarf, to samurai armor. The crown jewels, housed within the Tower of London, represent an unparalleled collection of regalia and ceremonial objects that symbolize the monarchy and its authority in the United Kingdom. The primary motivation behind our visit to the Tower of London was to witness the renowned crown jewels, particularly the koh -Noor diamond. Given its controversial history, seeing the koh -Noor in person was a lifelong aspiration. However, we were disappointed to discover that photography and videography were prohibited within the crown jewels exhibit. Nonetheless, the experience of viewing the dazzling collection of diamonds, crowns, and gold plates was indescribable and left us in awe. Guarded within the Jewel House, a highly secure chamber within the Tower Complex, these treasures hold immense historical and cultural significance, embodying centuries of royal tradition and pageantry. The crown jewels consist of various items, including crowns, scepters, orbs, swords, and ceremonial regalia, crafted from precious metals and adorned with an array of dazzling gemstones. Among the most famous pieces is the Imperial State Crown, worn by monarchs during the state opening of Parliament and other important ceremonial occasions. Adorned with over 2,800 diamonds, including the magnificent Cullinan II diamond, as well as pearls, the Black Prince's ruby, the Stuart sapphire, St. Edward's sapphire, and other precious stones. The Imperial State Crown is a stunning example of craftsmanship and luxury. Another highlight of the collection is the Sovereign Scepter with Cross, which features the Cullinan I Diamond, the largest clear-cut diamond in the world, weighing an astonishing 530 carats. This remarkable gemstone is set atop the scepter, symbolizing the monarch's authority and power. Other notable pieces include the St. Edward's Crown, used for the coronation of British monarchs, the Sovereign's Orb, representing the monarch's role as defender of the faith and the sword of state, signifying the monarch's role as protector of the realm. 
The Kohinoor diamond holds a storied place within the Tower of London's history, symbolizing both wealth and power. Acquired by the British East India Company in 1849 during the rule of the British Empire in India, the Kohinoor was subsequently presented to Queen Victoria. The Kohinoor diamond, whose name means Mountain of Light in Persian, has a remarkable history that spans centuries and continents. Mined from the Kollur Mines, also known as the Golconda Mines, in India, this extraordinary gem has passed through the hands of numerous rulers and conquerors, each adding to its storied legacy. The Kohinoor's journey began in the hands of the Kakatiya dynasty, who prized the diamond for its exceptional size and clarity. The Kohinoor diamond, weighing 105 carats, around 21 grams, and oval-shaped, is one of the most controversial diamonds in the world. Over time, it came into the possession of Alauddin Kilji, the powerful sultan of Delhi, before finding its way to Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire. Under the reign of Shah Jahan, the Kohinoor became a part of illustrious Mughal treasury. Shah Jahan's era, known as the Golden Age of the Mughals, was characterized by cultural, architectural, and artistic achievements, and the Kohinoor's presence added to the splendor of his court. Nevertheless, both the Kohinoor diamond and the peacock throne represent the pinnacle of luxury and artistic achievement in India's royal history, captivating admirers with their beauty, grandeur, and enduring allure. In 1739, Emperor Nader Shah, ruler of Iran and founder of the Afsharid dynasty, initiated an invasion of northern India. Following his army's decisive victory over the Mughals at the Battle of Karnal, Nader Shah proceeded to besiege and eventually capture the Mughal capital of Delhi. After the departure of the Iranian troops from Delhi, Nader Shah made a significant gesture by returning all territories east of the Indus River, which he had conquered, to Muhammad Shah, the Mughal emperor. However, before their departure, the Iranian military loaded a massive amount of plundered riches, including treasures and riches accumulated during the invasion. This vast hall of plunder, including the peacock throne and the Kohinoor diamond, was transported on a staggering number of animals, 700 elephants, 4,000 camels, and 12,000 horses, symbolizing the extent of their conquest and the wealth acquired from their campaign. Nader Shah used the Kohinoor diamond to craft an amulet. The Kohinoor diamond then passed into the possession of Ahmad Shah Durrani in Afghanistan. It eventually came into the possession of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. The ruler of the Sikh Empire in Punjab governed extensive territories that stretched across significant regions of present-day Pakistan and India. However, the Kohinoor's fate took a dramatic turn with the rise of the British East India Company. Lord Dalhousie, who served as the Governor General of India from 1848 to 1856, played a pivotal role in the transfer of the Koh-i-Noor diamond from the East India Company to Queen Victoria. During his tenure, the East India Company, representing the British government, obtained the Koh-i-Noor after the demise of Ranjit Singh. After the Second Anglo-Sikh War in 1848-49 and the Treaty of Lahore, the Koh-i-Noor diamond was surrendered to the British crown. Duleep Singh ascended to the position of Maharaja of the Sikh Empire at the young age of five, Following the conclusion of the Second Anglo-Sikh War, at the age of 15, he was exiled to England with a pension, marking the end of the line for Sikh Maharajas in the Punjab. Maharani Jind Kaur, regent of the Sikh Empire and mother of Duleep Singh, was forcibly separated from her son. In 1850, under Lord Dalhousie's direction, the Koh-i-Noor was presented to Queen Victoria, symbolizing British supremacy in India. The Kohinoor diamond is shrouded in a legendary curse, believed to bring misfortune to its owners. According to folklore, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. Only God or woman can wear it with impunity. While Queen Victoria wore the diamond as a brooch, it eventually became part of the crown jewels. First in the crown of Queen Alexandra, the wife of Edward VII, Queen Victoria's oldest son. And then in the crown of Queen Mary, the wife of George V, grandson of Queen Victoria. The diamond came to its current place of honor in 1937. 
At the front of the crown worn by the Queen Mother, wife of George VI, and mother of Queen Elizabeth II. Upon the Queen Mother's demise in 2002, the crown adorned her coffin during the lying in state and funeral ceremonies. These historic crowns are now exhibited at the Jewel House within the Tower of London, featuring crystal replicas of the diamond embedded in the earlier crowns. Additionally, visitors can view the original armlet presented to Queen Victoria. A glass rendition of the Koh i Noor offers insight into its appearance upon arrival in the United Kingdom. The history of the crown jewels is as rich and storied as the monarchy itself. Many of the pieces have been passed down through generations of monarchs, while others have been created or modified for specific coronations and events. The jewels have survived wars, political upheavals, and even attempts at theft, thanks in part to the stringent security measures in place at the Tower of London. Visitors to the Tower of London have the opportunity to view the crown jewels firsthand, as they are displayed in a specially designed exhibition within the Jewel House. Here, visitors can marvel at the exquisite craftsmanship and breathtaking beauty of these historic treasures, while learning about their significance and the ceremonies in which they are used. We purchased a miniature crown from their souvenir shop, a wonderful memento to remember our visit to the crown jewel. Originally built by William the Conqueror in the 11th century, this historic fortress has served various roles throughout its long existence, including as a royal residence, a prison, an armory, and even a treasury. However, among its many legends and tales, one of the most enduring is that of the ravens that inhabit its grounds. Legend has it that the fate of the kingdom is intricately linked to the presence of these magnificent birds. According to an ancient belief, should the ravens ever leave the tower, the kingdom would fall. To ensure the birds remain within its walls, a tradition emerged that requires at least six ravens to be kept at the tower at all times. The care of these ravens is taken very seriously. Each bird is given a name and closely monitored by the yeoman warders, also known as the bee feeders, who serve as both guides and guardians of the tower. The raven's wings are clipped to prevent them from flying too far away, but they are otherwise free to roam the grounds, interacting with visitors and delighting them with their majestic presence. The ravens of the tower are not only beloved symbols of British folklore, but also living embodiments of the nation's history. They have witnessed centuries of political intrigue, royal drama, and significant historical events. Their presence adds a touch of mystery and magic to the tower, enhancing its already rich tapestry of stories and legends. Visitors flock to the tower not only to admire its medieval architecture and explore its dark dungeons, but also to catch a glimpse of these mythical birds. The ravens have become an integral part of the tower's allure, captivating the imaginations of people from around the world. In addition to their symbolic significance, the ravens also play a practical role in the preservation of the tower. Their presence helps control the population of pests, such as rats and mice, which could otherwise pose a threat to the historic structure and its contents. Overall, the ravens of the Tower of London serve as guardians of both legend and history, standing as silent sentinels over one of the most iconic landmarks in the world. As long as they continue to grace its grounds with their presence, the tower will remain a symbol of resilience, endurance, and the enduring spirit of the British monarchy. The Tower of London, with its formidable walls and storied past, has served as more than just a fortress and royal residence. Among its many roles throughout history, perhaps one of the most fascinating is its tenure as a home to a menagerie of exotic animals, known as the Royal Beasts. That's why you'll see wire animal sculptures throughout the fortress. Dating back to the early medieval period, the Tower's menagerie was established as a symbol of royal power and prestige, 
monarchs and nobles sought to display their wealth and dominion by collecting exotic creatures from distant lands, which were often gifts from foreign rulers or brought back from overseas expeditions. These royal beasts represented a display of the monarch's might and connections to far-off lands, and they were housed within the tower's grounds in enclosures specially built to accommodate their needs. Among the menagerie's residents were lions, leopards, tigers, elephants, and even a polar bear, each captivating the imaginations of visitors from all walks of life. The menagerie reached its peak during the medieval period when it boasted a diverse collection of creatures from across the globe. The animals were not only a source of entertainment for the royal court, but also a testament to the monarch's ability to command and control the natural world. However, life in the tower's menagerie was far from idyllic for the royal beasts. Confined to cramped enclosures and subjected to inadequate care, many of the animals suffered greatly, leading to high mortality rates. Despite the best efforts of the keepers, who often had little understanding of the animals' needs, the menagerie was a far cry from the modern zoological institutions we know today. As attitudes towards animal welfare began to evolve in the 19th century, the conditions within the menagerie came under increased scrutiny. In 1835, the decision was made to relocate the animals to the newly established London Zoo in Regent's Park, where they could be housed in more spacious and humane conditions. The Tower of London stands as a symbol of centuries of British history and tradition, and one of its most iconic ceremonies is the Yeoman Warder's Key Ceremony. Also known as the Ceremony of the Keys, this ritual has been performed nightly for over 700 years, making it one of the oldest and most enduring traditions in the Tower's history. The formal locking and unlocking of the Tower Gates started in the mid-1300s on the orders of a furious Edward III. He decreed that the tower should be locked at sunset and unlocked at sunrise. The ceremonial opening takes place in the morning. The duty yeoman warder and a military escort of the main guard march to open both the middle tower and the byward tower. Then the public is allowed to enter the Tower of London. Each night, precisely at 9.53 p.m., the chief yeoman warder, accompanied by an escort of guards, proceeds to the outer gates of the tower. There, they are met by a detachment of soldiers from the Queen's Guard who await their arrival. The ceremony of the keys serves as a symbol of the tower's security and the custodianship of its treasures. With solemn reverence, the chief yeoman warder presents the keys to the tower's gates to the officer of the guard. The officer then challenges the chief yeoman warder, asking, The guards cries out, Halt! Who comes there? The yeoman warder replies, The keys? Whose keys? King Charles's keys? Pass then. All's well. With these formalities complete, the chief yeoman warder and his escort proceed to secure the tower for the night. While tickets must be obtained in advance due to limited availability, as ceremonial guardians of the tower, the yeoman warders, commonly known as bee feeders, are provided with accommodation within the fortress grounds. Some of these living quarters date as far back as the 13th century. In times past, the tower hosted numerous pubs, but today only one remains, the Yeoman Warders Club. This exclusive establishment is accessible solely to bee feeders and their invited guests. Today, the Tower of London is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of London's most popular tourist attractions. Visitors from around the world flock to explore its ancient battlements, marvel at its medieval architecture, and admire the priceless crown jewels housed within the Jewel House. The Yeoman Warders, popularly known as Beefeaters, provide guided tours, regaling visitors with tales of the Tower's history and the colorful characters who inhabited it. This monument is a living piece of history that has evolved through the generations. It's witnessed the best and worst of humanity, from the splendor of coronations to the plotting within its walls that has shaped the narrative of the British Isle.
It's a place of contrasts and conundrums, and that's what makes the Tower of London not just a must-visit destination, but a never-ending source of stories for us to delve into. And that's all for today, folks. I hope I've inspired you to think about the Tower of London in a new light. Join us next time for another episode. We will dust off the pages of history and bring to life another fascinating chapter from London. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe and share it with your friends or leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, keep an eye on the Ravens and remember history is not just about the past. It's a story that continues to unfold. I'm, and this has been Tower of London. Cheerio!